Kia ora, I'm Ewan Robertson, son of Ian Alexander Robertson, grandson of Jock or John Robertson, and great son, uh, great grandson of Alexander Robertson and William John Towers. This presentation explores the lives of 1860 soldier settlers through the life of my great grandfather William Towers, uh, an imperial soldier, and how investigating his story led to the discovery of the use of tartan blankets as bush dress by uh, Māori and Pākehā during the later stages of the New Zealand wars. This inquiry results in me designing and advertising, uh, sorry, and weaving a tartan to coincide with the Scarred Nations Symposium. Now, I should have my slides. Nope, must be it this way. Yes, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> this presentation does not represent a resolution of my inquiry, um, rather it is another step in a journey of discovery, one of personal identity uh, and connection to place, history and the, pro and the process of colonisation, um, particularly conflict through the story of my ancestor and the act of weaving an original tartan garment. I am no historian. So I apologise in advance for any inaccuracies. <laughs> I'm also slightly overawed by the the acumen, the academic acumen here. So um, I will do my best. Um, so who was William Towers, and what was his connection to this narrative? Little is known of William until he enlisted in the 17th Regiment of Foot, or the, what's called the Glasgow Greys, in 1853, aged 21. Uh, the regiment was formed in 1756 and fought in many global conflicts, including the American Revolution, the French Revolution Wars, India, and obviously New Zealand. William fought in the 1857-59 Indian military mutiny, where Indian troops rebelled against their British commanders. Uh, this mutiny obviously grew to involve the ordinary citizens uprising against British colonial rule highlighting the parallels to the New Zealand conflict. The reality of army life in India wasn't easy as they battled heat, boredom and exotic foods. More men died from poisoning, heat stroke and diseases like cholera than from battle injuries. Uh, while nothing is known of William's uh, experiences in India, in India, you could speculate that the cultural collision he experienced framed his thinking, behaviour and approach to Māori in New Zealand. The regiment landed in New Zealand from Calcutta in 1861 after three months at sea. Like many imperial regiments, he fought in skirmishes and battles across the North Island. Military records state that the 70th fought with other government troops against a number of Māori fortifications in Taranaki. Similarly, the regiment was involved in numerous Waikato campaigns. Not all of the regiment's actions was against Māori defending their right to self-determination. In November 1863, William, along with 99 other rank and file from the 70th, travelled to Otago to help suppress the gold prospectors and pastoralist protests. Ill discipline in the gold fields and outlying farms uh, caused havoc for the farmers and authorities. Oops, I've jumped, I think. Have I jumped a bit? No. Hang on, just got to get the right one. Yes, okay. William was um, discharged in New Plymouth in 1865. So he'd had probably about, um, you know, nearly 20 years of, of kind of fighting in, in different sort of forms. So as I said, he was discharged in 18, uh, 1865 to become a soldier settler. Uh, 18,000 imperial troops arrived in New Zealand between 1840 and 1870 as both garrison and combat troops. The uh, Hugh and Lynn Hughes 1980 book um, discharged in New Zealand listed all imperial soldiers, including obviously William Towers, that were discharged in New Zealand. A total of 280 soldiers and officers from the 70th Regiment, alongside a further 3,661 rank and file and non commissioned officers from the other 14 regiments discharged in New Zealand. Oops. Like many soldiers, the incentive to discharge in New Zealand. Uh, was the opportunity to take up small land grants um, occupying land confiscated from Māori. 
The, wa the Waste Land Settlement Act converted traditional communal land into individual titles that allowed settlers to purchase uh, from the Crown. The land was to be developed to benefit the new settlers, their communities, and obviously, ultimately, the Crown. William moved to Thames in 1865. Uh, but the land assigned to him for farming was not fit for purpose, being too hilly and too, re uh, too rocky. He resorted to mining the land for gold with little success. Uh, he requested alternative claims from the, Navy, the Naval and Military Land Commission, but was again unsuccessful. Little is known about William after he settled in, in Paraguay, obviously also in Thames. He died there in 1906. Uh, in his master's thesis, Soldiers and Settlers, John McLennan explored the challenges faced by early soldier settlers in New Zealand. As imperial soldiers were tasked with upholding British Empire interests, they became an instrument in Māori land alienation. Uh, as settlers, they then populated confiscated land, becoming an inexpensive means of embedding and, and, um, and expanding uh, empire interests. McLennan states that the land was a keystone British objective. Discharged soldiers were also a cheaper option than settlers on assisted passage. Discharged soldiers were attracted to the Crown because of their hands-on skills, perseverance, and the hard grafting in difficult conditions after many years in the army. These attributes were valued by their communities and provincial councils. Uh, and they were needed to, to, to yield uh, productive land, skills sometimes lacking in civilian settlers. Their military expertise were also needed to quell so-called rebel Māori in imperial, as imperial soldiers left the colony in the late 1860s. The parallels of uh, alienation from ancestral lands would not have been lost um, on Scot soldiers as large swathes of clan lands were confiscated as a result of the failed Jacobite rebellion, especially the aftermath of the Battle of Culloden on Dramusi Moor in, in 1746. The rebellion sought to remove the Hanoverian King George II, putting the rightful King uh, Charles Edward Stuart on the throne. <coughs> clan lands uh, sorry, Scottish clan land, like Māori land, held ancestral and spiritual connections to both that were both complex and highly valued. Significant tenant uh, evacuations during the Highland Clearances, uh, 1740 to 1860, resulted in many Scots uh, communities being forced to relocate to unfamiliar, unfamiliar coastal regions, barely surviving on fishing and the collection of kelp to generate income. The shift from farm to croft, which is a small pocket-sized uh, rented plot of arable land, was a bitter pill to swallow. Croft overcrowding uh, then led to a mass migration to the colonies. Interestingly, the uh, English landowners and uh, the English educated clan chiefs believed there was more profit from grazing sheep than that generated from tenant farmers. The 1746 Act, Act of Prescription in Scotland, a response to the Jacobite uprising, sought to suppress and assimilate the Highland clan system and culture into English Enlightenment. Clan chief authority was removed. Judicial districts or sheriffdoms were forfeit to the Crown. Highland dress, tartan and bagpipes. In effect, their traditional way of life and identity were banned. Joining the British Army was the only way many uh, Scotsmen could legitimately wear tartan and kilts. Mass migration of Scots meant that tartan played a valued role in defining their identity, maintaining individual and collective um, distinctiveness. It could be argued that tartan was symbolic of both oppression and rebellion. Danny uh, Pickering's 2022 article, Harm Received, Harm Caused, explores, explores the dilemma some Scottish settlers face in New Zealand through the diary records of her great, great, great grandfather, Neil MacLeod. He migrated from his dis dis dispossessed ancestral home of Rasse, it's, it's an island in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, in 1864. Uh, unexpected revelations appeared in, in MacLeod's diaries. The anticipated philosophical conflict of a former 
colonised person becoming a coloniser through contributing to and benefiting from dispossessed Māori was not what materialised. The expected empathy with Māori, also seeking their independence from the British Crown, was not evident. Economic opportunities, increasing personal wealth, therefore privilege, came to the fore. Further diary entries raised another revelation, that of a racial prejudice amongst sundry Scot settlers. MacLeod did not see Māori as his equal. Anti-black stereotypes and ideologies were used to marginalise Māori. He was able to process and legitimise the dispossession of, of Māori peoples from their land because he, like his, his kin, had also been raised on anti-black typecasting. He had no misgivings of treating Māori as he and his clansmen had been treated. This raises the question, did William Towers also buy into this reasoning? Was he able to detach himself and his deeds from past experiences in Britain? Human nature often takes the advantages offered by buying into the dominant culture of the time. Unfortunately, no diaries or records of William exist, so this can or cannot be discounted. A strong link to things Scottish as history and my Highland roots have framed my identity for at least four decades. The culture, the stories, especially the origins, symbolism and evolution of tartan and kilts fascinated me and still do. I am the fifth generation of my family who, like my great-grandfather, served in the army. Scottishness, tartan, kilts <laughs> and the links to the military transports me to other places and time. So. William's story was, uh, the f was basically just an interest as a genealogical um, project. It became an engaging strand connecting another research project exploring the use of tartan blankets worn by both, as, sorry, tartan blankets worn as kilts by both Māori and Pākehā militia. It was this link that sparked a number of conundrums and possibilities. On the discovery of a photograph showing a militia unit in their bush uniforms, including tartan kilts, intrigued me. Other photos of militia stories regarding the tartan wearing of tartan were uncovered, acting as a segue into the tartan project. Uh, various militia troops in Māori wore tartan blanks in kilt configuration instead of traditional uh, pia pia, uh, rapata or trousers. Research available into the adaption of tartan blankets into kilts by Māori and militia, the, including the Arab Conservatory, has been very sketchy. The kilts, termed as bush shawls or bush dress, appeared in the late 1860 when the militia units were formed to protect Pākehā communities and property as Imperial so troops started departing New Zealand. Research suggests that these fringed tartan garments uh, were utilised by Māori from blankets plundered from soldiers or from blankets traded uh, for land. Research suggests that tartan blankets were often worn as shawls by Māori of mana, so as a symbol of status. As British un uniforms often rotted and tore in the w at wet bush, the kilt serves a pragmatic and warm solution. The parallels experiences, um, sorry, this parallels experiences of kilts worn in the Scottish Highlands. The wool and early um, fabric on early tartans used natural and added oils to help repel water. The forest rangers started wearing rapaki uh, skirts made from harakiki to combat the, um, the effects of the bush and the swamps. Tartan blankets replaced these as they became scarce. The, this dress code was adopted by local um, militia and the armed constabulary. Whoops, what's happened there? Ah. Uh, reproducing an, uh, an early tartan blanket was a catalyst to design and weave a tartan. Early tartan blankets patterns were usually generic with no obvious resemblance to clan tartans. The basic patterns mostly featured muted and, and understated colours. Basic tartan patterns uh, existed 4,000 years ago. This, this one behind us, the simple patterning of the Falkirk a tartan uh, was unearthed in Scotland. Um, 1800 years ago. It wasn't until the 16th century that uh, tartans evolved into what we recognise uh, today. There's many myths exist around Scottish tartans. 
one that still exists today, back, dates back from the 1822 visit to Edinburgh by King George IV. The myth being is you could only wear a specific tartan if you had a verifiable claim to that clan. Um, clans and their subjects ha often have many tartan variations for hunting, dress, regional differences, etc. 10 to 20 tartan variations for one clan is actually not uncommon. The advantages of making large quantities of the same tartan were obvious, as many clansmen and women wore um, cloth items featuring local patterns, other clans recognised them, thus becoming identifiable as a specific clan tartan. In the 1746 Act of Prescription Banning Tartan resulted in many tartans being lost forever. In 1819, the notable Scottish weaving firm of Wilson and Sons had 250 tartan samples collected from all over Scotland. Only 100 of these actually had named clans to them. Um, King George the, the Fourth visit abetted by the renowned Scottish author Sir Walter Scott, resulted in a tartan free-for-all. Clan chiefs were requested to attend official events during the King's visit in their named clan tartans. Most had no knowledge of their authentic clan tartan. The consequent being that many unnamed tartans in the Wilson collection acquired new authentic name, the names becoming officially signed to clan. So there's a lot of tan tartans out there that people thought, yeah, this is an authentic to a MacLeod, to a Fraser, to a Robertson, to a whatever. But that's not the case, because there's only a hundred. <laughs> this is actually authentic. Uh, the reality is most uh, clansmen wore whatever tartan was available. They often wore a, a mix of garments and, and uh, tartan, so they were quite fashionable, if, if, obviously, if they could afford it. Today, over 7,000 tartans are recorded, with 3,000 plus registered with the Scottish Tartan Authority, including uh, clan, country, state, company, society, and individual tartans. There is a wonderful tartan um, for the company that makes Iron Brew. Iron Brew is a, a very sweet drink that outsells Coca-Cola. It's the only country in the world <laughs> that outsells Coca-Cola. Um, never having woven anything before, various experiments and test fabrics were undertaken to learn the art of weaving. The first large fabric provided an idea of what was to follow, mostly by serendipity. Not being a competent weaver, uh, my use of inferior yarns, incorrect tensions, resulted in some interesting changes uh, as, as the chest fabric developed, which is this one here. Um, it started well, but deteriorated as the yarn started to snap. Um, and, but also an epiphany occurred. Could the perfect threads and weaving resemble notions of unity, the early parts, while the broken and imperfect weaving in the fabric potentially re represent notions of acrimony. Um, experimenting with different materials of the weft of the fabric created opportunities to explore visual narratives. The addition of miniature-led Māori warriors and uh, militia troops to the fabric became a metaphor for land and conflict. If you wanted to come down, there's a few of the little beasties um, in the tartan here. The uh, Scott Nation Symposium sparked the idea to design a weaver, tartan, a weaver tartan inspired by the New Zealand Wars. By combining colours from both sides of the conflict, could the weaving process and resultant fabric be used as a means to highlight narratives about the New Zealand Wars to an often uninformed audience? An idea occurred that the possibility of an inoffensive everyday fabric Uncovering and interwining soldier, settler, and Māori narratives associated with tartan could be a segue to understanding their shared experiences. Research of Archives New Zealand, uh, National Library files, identified colours uh, for both Māori, rebels dress, and British Army plus militia uniforms. Robert Stack's 1879 book exploring colours associated with Māori highlighted the use of red and black. Hazel Petrie's article exploring colours of rank in Māori society examines missionary 
uh, Richard Taylor's 1855 book that states that red represented the mana of uh, rangatira, uh, high rank, and black represented slaves, often war captives. Taylor also observes chiefs painted in red ochre and slaves with charcoal before they went to war. Yes, yes, I'm the last, but here, perfect. Um, militia units had many variations, but tended to follow imperial soldier uniform patterns and colours. Dark blue jumpers, blue trousers, red walt, uh, blue forage cap. Some inf um, infantry volunteers adopted a grey uh, tweed. In 1867, the New Zealand government formed a new and permanent force, the Armed Constabulary, to simply and to simplify volunteer and militia systems. It was these colours that I used to try and represent and entwine shared, shared narratives and histories around accord and conflict. I began weaving the New Zealand Wars tartan at Massey University before retiring to Nelson three years ago. The um, nearly completed fabric has remained unfinished, like the histories it was represented. It was designed to represent. So this is the first time it has come off the loom in four years. So I had no idea what it would look like. And looking at some of it, there's some there's really good stuff. And those of you that are good with weaving, don't look too closely. Thank you. <laughs>